Coming up, the White House Tribal Nations Summit concludes today. How did this historic gathering come to be? Jody Archambeau will give us the history. Plus, what are the results from this year's summit? We're joined by ICT Managing Editor Jordan bennett Begay to give us a rundown. I'm Mark Trahant. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. President Joe Biden signed into law Monday a $1 trillion infrastructure deal before a bipartisan celebratory crowd on the White House lawn. He said this massive infusion of cash for roads, bridges, ports, and more is going to make life change for the better for the American people. On the same day, the president hailed a new era for nation-to-nation -nation engagement with tribes, at the White House Tribal Nations Summit, Biden spoke for about nine minutes and told tribal leaders the steps he is taking to improve communities, including passing the American Rescue Plan. That legislation targets $31 billion for Indian country, making it the most significant tribal investment in the history of this country. To promote the plan, First Lady Jill Biden visited the Navajo Nation in April, something the president addressed. I was kidding my wife, Jill, who'll be out here shortly. She's visited the Navajo Nation so many times, I'm worried she's not gonna come home. Uh, but look, I've been proud, she, I'm proud to, uh, of the, to, to name Native American leaders in my administration. Not only the first Native American cabinet secretary, and it won't be the last in history, but more than 50 Native Americans now serving in significant roles in my administration. The president also signed an executive order Monday. It directs federal officials to work with tribal nations on a strategy to improve public safety and advance justice for missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Monday's events included remarks from Interior Secretary Deb Holland. I'm grateful to stand here on the shoulders of the many leaders who came before me. I know that I stand here because the path that many of you carved ahead of me was clear. I intend to work with and for all of you so that we can ensure that our children have every opportunity to achieve their dreams and one day stand on my shoulders to achieve even more of what is needed to help tribal nations grow and prosper. First Lady Jill Biden gave remarks as well as several secretaries of federal agencies, including Dr. Anthony Fauci. And there is more news coming out of the White House Tribal Nations Summit. A tribal intergovernmental affairs advisory committee is being formed to help direct the Housing and Urban Development Agency. This first of its kind committee will be made up of tribal leaders and senior HUD officials to help shape the programs and make sure tribal needs are being met. The new advisory committee was published in the Federal Register to get input from the tribes. In the next few months, HUD will ask for nominations of tribal leaders to serve on the committee. This is part of the Biden administration's effort to end homelessness in Indian country. With the signing of the bipartisan infrastructure bill on Monday, $736 million will be made available for Indian country. The Bureau of Indian Affairs will allocate the money to pay for infrastructure issues, such as road maintenance and tribal climate resilience. Secretary Holland released a statement saying in part, as the effects of climate change continue to intensify, indigenous communities are facing unique climate related challenges that pose existential threats to tribal economies, infrastructure, livelihoods, and health. Coastal communities are facing flooding, erosion, permafrost, subsidence, sea level rise, and storm surges, while inland communities are facing worsening drought and extreme heat. 
The deal also includes $2.5 billion to help the department fulfill settlements of Indian water rights claims and deliver long promised water resources to tribes. In Australia, an indigenous led project is helping to protect land from erosion. The Healing Country program not only provides environmental training for indigenous youth, but it also helps bridge the city country divide. Trainees in the program repair badly eroded cattle country while giving them a solid base for future employment opportunities. These Healing Country projects are being funded through the Queensland government's Relief Assistance Program. And one young trainee is already setting his sights on the future. From here, I'd like to try and do some maybe ranger work, and that'll be a good goal for me to set. The program also plans to reduce the runoff into the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Indigenous actress Amber Midthunder is all set to star in the new Predator prequel. The thriller titled Prey takes three, place 300 years ago in the Comanche Nation's territory. The movie follows Mid Thunder's character, Naru, a skilled warrior who protects her people against the highly evolved alien. She celebrated the news on Instagram, sharing an image of herself in the film with the predator behind her. A citizen of the Fort Peck and Assiniboine Sioux tribes, Mid Thunder has also talked about the importance of indigenous representation in entertainment. The movie currently has a summer 2020 release date. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahan. Coming up, a look at what happened at this year's White House Tribal Nations Summit. And first, we learn the history behind the historic gathering, and we'll be right back. The White House Tribal Nations Summit is going on this week. It's a manifestation of the government-to-government -government relationship between tribal nations and the United States. That relationship goes back more than two centuries, yet the White House Summit has a much shorter history. Jody Archambeau was one of the people responsible for its creation. She helped organize North Dakota for candidate Barack Obama, and then after his victory, went to work in the Obama-Biden administration, where she held a variety of posts, including a senior advisor on the Domestic Policy Council to the, White Pre to the president. She joins us today from North Dakota. Welcome, Jody. Hi, good to see you, Mark. So how did this uh, White House summit unfold? What's the history here? So what happened was during the campaign for then candidate Barack Obama, the policy team that was advising him uh, actually got him to go on record with when he went to the Crow Nation to talk about meeting with tribal leaders on a nation to nation basis. Uh, that something that had happened uh, sporadically throughout time, but not definitely not uh, on a yearly basis. I think there were accounts of Clinton meeting once. There were definitely meetings with Bush. Uh, various presidents did meet with tribal leaders, but on a very small scale. This was a commitment to meet with all tribal leaders, invite them all to DC and not to handpick and uh, sort of sort out some of the uh, leaders that made their way to, to the president's office in the past. As you know, so often in Washington, public policy can get up close to the finish line and then just, it finds it so difficult to make that next step. A summit like this really pushes things through in a way that's really unprecedented. Yes, I think one of the biggest aspects of the Tribal Nations Conference is that you have a number of cabinet secretaries who want to speak to tribal nations. This. Uh, Tribal Nations Summit provides an opportunity for those cabinet secretaries as well as the president to reveal, unveil some of the accomplishments and achievements that they've had with the president sitting in office, stating to his cabinet members on a weekly basis that he wants to have a greater, a, a better record, <laughs> a greater, not just engagement, but uh, a turning of the page of history. Uh, with with native nations that's something that uh is is hard to do in terms of getting the visibility on it but with the tribal nations conference it's a time where the president and everybody else sits in front of the press pool stating to the world how they're how they're doing um on on some of the things that the tribal leaders are asking for 
And certainly the tribal leaders have been engaging with the at the cabinet level uh, since since the, uh, the, this administration came in office. But when President Obama, when we first started the tribal summit, it was something that was a very rare occurrence for people to be meeting with high levels of of the federal government in in any capacity. It was it was a rarity. And with the Tribal Nations Conference, those are just everyday uh, situations. You'd have like uh, an agency like EPA or HHS prior to 2009 um, who would have regular engagements with tribes through their advisory councils. But this uh, this Tribal Nations Conference and the White House uh, White House Council on Native American Affairs creates a regular rhythm of high level officials coming together and uh, sort of one upping each other <laughs> on on what they're able to accomplish um, in partnership with tribal nations. This isn't top down. This is tribal nations coming to the table with real policy asks and the people who are in, in office uh, working, looking, turning to their staff and getting them to execute on it on a, this is on a weekly basis. This isn't just a one-off every two years or so. Well, I want to ask you about that institutional nature. I think about um, first with President Lyndon Johnson and his Indian policy, followed by Richard Nixon's uh, message to Congress. And both of those kind of became institutionalized where almost every president feels like they have to come out with a policy. Is this the same thing? This is not the same thing because of the Trump administration not really abiding by the executive order and the sporadic stops and starts. The, the end of the administration was really when you saw President Trump taking action on missing and murdered indigenous women. You have to give credit where credit is due. He did highlight that issue and put together an interagency um, committee. However, uh, we know that there are many, many more issues that require a coordinated, not just one agency, one off type of response. It's, it requires a, a full comprehensive uh, presidential level attention. And that's something that did not happen uh, in a meaningful way during that, that I could see from the, the Trump administration. There were people that were um, working hard in the regular agencies like Indian Affairs. There were people who were in the White House who were native and, and, and doing the good work. But unfortunately, the, the Trump administration did not do better than the Obama administration. And Biden administration with, with all of the, just the funding alone, you can talk about how the levels are rising with each Democratic presidency. And I hope that the Republicans, um, uh, with with any kind of, uh, if I had a crystal ball, I hope that they take this as a message that they are going to have to do a lot better than what they're doing when they're in office. Um, Recovery Act during the the uh, Recovery Act. Do you remember the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act? Uh, that was 2.5 billion for tribes. That was a big deal. Uh, now this is Congress in in coordination with the presidency, the the ARPA money, the the COVID response money from last uh, from the last administration. But we're talking 32 billion dollars alone for tribes, 20 billion just for tribal government economic response, uh, infrastructure bill, 13 billion. Um, that alone, that's you know 45 billion dollars with just with those two bills. It's, it's incredible progress from 2.5 billion and everybody getting excited about that to these massive um, influxes, which are sorely needed. $2.5 billion was not enough. Uh, the packages that are happening right now do warrant a greater investment for the, the people and the governments that have been woefully left out of the investments of the past. Well, in a way, because of the size of those investments, it's going to take years to get through the system. So almost no matter what happens, tribes are going to be able to take advantage of that for the next few years. Yes, I think there's there's going to be that this can't be the last of it because we're certainly uh, behind the, the curve on just just water settlements alone. This uh, water settlements, schools, uh, broadband, you name it, there's there's been investments across the United States that have left out tribes for centuries. So 
this influx of funding right now is a good start, but it shouldn't be the end of it. And uh, during the Recovery Act, we were able to push out that funding. And this is where tribes are able to show their capacity and move move funding. The, the issues that they're dealing with are the same ones that have been in the past in, in terms of the bureaucracy, the, the federal bureaucracy and, and making sure that the, the funding is uh, spent in a way that Congress intended, but also that is is functional for tribes. There's There's got to be some practicality put into how these funds are dis- dispensed and distributed. I, I want to ask you about how this expansive nature uh, impacts tribal leadership and tribal communities. It, it, so many of us learn a lot about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Health System, but we don't learn as much about Medicaid or other parts of the federal government. But by having a conference of this scope, does it change the way we think about federal programs and what they can do to impact our lives? Absolutely. One of the climate change initiatives of the Biden administration is to really look at the 30 by 30 initiative that Biden unveiled in his first days in office. And that 30 by 30 initiative is largely built off of existing authorities that currently tribes do not have access to, um, namely the Land and Water Conservation Fund that is almost a billion dollars that comes from oil and oil leases and, and sales um, off, you know, on the outer continental shelf. So those are, th- that's income that the, the federal government gets and tribes have not received hardly any of that money since in the 42, 43 years that it's been in existence. Now that's funding that federal agencies can use to purchase lands, such as in the federal, um, in, the, in the Forest Service and in the BLM, National Park Service, very Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Tribes do not do not have access to those kinds of funds, nor do they have access to the recreational part. And so those are places where you go into any room that is dealing with this 30 by 30 uh, conversation and the capacity for tribal leaders to learn a new program and to move on it where there's opportunity. Uh, we all know that there are there should be and there must be bigger conversations about reparations and how that looks with land, the land that has been taken um, over the years. The, the land loss is well over 98% for tribal governments. Um, we're, our land is what makes America. And just some of that, uh, that idea that this is a time for, I guess, the, the reckoning of, of how America was built should open up more of those kinds of funding sources so that tribes are not having to uh, pinch and scrape by with whatever little resources they have. And, and those kinds of transactions aren't just about money to purchase lands or to uh, move lands into tribal control. It's also about stewardship. It's also about co-management, which is really exciting to see some of those secretarial orders come out about the co-management there are a number of tribes who are better suited <laughs> to care for some of the public lands that have been neglected. And you, you can look at examples such as the Yakima Nation or Menominee, and their forests are phenomenal. They are above and beyond. They're internationally recognized for the stewardship and the excellent forest health. Um, so those are things that we should be looking at, not just looking at conservation groups to figure this out. Indian tribes should be at the table. Well, thank you so much, Jody Archambault. Thank you. When we come back, we'll have more information about the White House Tribal Summit from our Washington Bureau. This year's White House Tribal Nation Summit was a two-day virtual gathering. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, along with senior members of the administration, took part. So much more to do. So today I'm announcing five new initiatives. First, a new initiative involving 17 departments and agencies to protect tribal treaty rights in the work of the federal government. Second, a new initiative to increase tribal participation in the management and stewardship of federal lands. Third, my administration will be the first to work with the tribes to comprehensively incorporate 
tribal, e tribal ecological knowledge into the federal government scientific approach, helping us fight climate change. And fourth, taking action to protect the greater Chaco landscape in Northwest New Mexico from future oil and gas drilling and leasing. And fifth, I'm about to sign an executive order in a moment addressing the crisis of violence against Native Americans. Joining us is ICT's managing editor, Jordan bennett Begay to talk about what happened. Hi, Jordan. Hi, Mark. How are you? Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Happy to do it. What's the big takeaway from the summit? Oh my goodness. Well, it's virtual this year and it's the first one that has been um, that's happened since 2016, you know, during the Trump administration, the uh, summit wasn't happening at all. Um, but now the Biden administration brought it back. And this time, you know, when they do bring it back, it's virtual. Um, and there's hopes that next year it will be in person. I'm wondering what tribal leaders are saying. Does it make it easier in virtual or is it more uh, harder to get your message out? You know, that's one of the questions um, that our reporter, Callie Benali, is going to be exploring um, just because, you know, those who watch the summit um, virtually, you know, they were selected tribal leaders who were able to ask questions. Um, sometimes they weren't about the topic, but, you know, that's their one chance to ask higher officials um, what's going on. Um, you know, I, I, I answer question, you know, just in D.C. overall, because, you um, you know, the last story that one of our reporters did, Colby Kicking Woman, he said some, sometimes like the advocates who typically go on the Hill and go in these in-person meetings, um, they said they're more personal and they really enjoy it. And sometimes, and but then the virtual sense, like they're able to fit in the schedules of their congressional members. So I, I don't know, it's just like, uh, it's, it's really um, hard to tell at this point. The, the administration took a number of executive actions. Maybe tell us about those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they right before the summit started, you know, there is the big uh, uh, Chaco Canyon um, initiative and some other initiatives that were happening are the tribal treaty rights memorandum of understanding, the sacred sites um, memorandum of understanding, and the indigenous knowledge statement and establishment of like interagency working groups on indigenous traditional um, knowledge, just saying that uh, indigenous knowledge is you know, very significant and it's important um, and it should be definitely considered. Um, and then the last, one of the other ones was, I guess, improving public safety and criminal justice for native people and addressing missing murdered indigenous people. So this uh, initiative or this executive order directs the justice interior and homeland security departments to address um, specific law enforcement issues and to provide more support in uh, the health and human services um, are to develop a plan to prevent and, you know, and for prevention and survivor support. So there, there's a lot going on and I'm sure there's going to be more coming out. And with the announcement on the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives, uh, that also includes a new position. I'm wondering how that will help coordinate some of the issues. Yeah, I think that's always uh, the case because um, it is such a huge issue. Um, a lot of it be different coordination and just a lot of communication. I mean, I'm really interested to see, yeah, how, how that will work out too. One of the huge challenges for tribes, and I'm sure it came up in the summit, is um, spending the massive amount of investment that's coming from the United States for infrastructure and other projects. Uh, is there any roadmap to that? Um, yeah, I haven't seen um, much about it, you know, but a lot of it, uh, tribes are always just advocating that they need uh, funds for broadband was a huge thing, especially I think now during the pandemic, it's, you know, been proven. I mean, right here on the newscast, we're finding out um, how desperately like Indi that is needed in Indian country, um, especially if schools are, some schools are going back uh, just virtual or even like a hybrid um, uh, hi hybrid and you know I think that's that's at least like that's what I've been seeing like people are always advocating for um the broadband issue well and you really see that on many tribal communities where people are gathered around an internet point even if it's a McDonald's <laughs> yeah right and in a lot of I think a lot of community centers or even tribal offices um during the pandemic uh 
opened up their Wi-Fi just because they know students need to get their schoolwork done. Um, I, I, I know that's what I would have done. <laughs> uh, sit outside in your car and here's my password. <laughs> We have less than a minute left, but I want to ask you about today's session, which is breakouts. What, what's happening today? Um, today, I mean, they're just going to be, you know, talking more about the specific issues. Um, I mean, it's really hard to tell at this point, um, but I hope like tribal leaders will, will be able to, you know, direct their questions to officials and um, have more of that intimate, like one-on-one. -on -one versus yesterday was like the big, the big, the big gathering, you know, more of like the big picture look. Um, so I hope they get that um, more time. It's interesting because since this uh, White House summit, this is actually the first time it's at the White House, even though it's virtual, because just the sheer number of people involved, it could never fit in the White House. <laughs> That's true. You could see, I believe, see it all on one screen when Joe Biden was up there. Uh, that was pretty neat to see. It was like a huge collage. <laughs> thank you, Jordan bennett Begay. Yeah, thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.